We need random numbers for different purposes in security and cryptography for generating keys. Uh, we often initialize algorithms with uh, some initial value, often some initial random value. And an important thing is that the attacker shouldn't be able to guess the value that we're using. So therefore, choosing a random value is important. But we need our computer to generate that random value. And our computer is deterministic. It follows some algorithm. So we need that algorithm to be such that it's very hard for the attacker to be able to guess what our random number will be, even though it does follow some algorithm. And we distinguish between true random number generators and pseudo-random number generators. A true generator uses some external source, some measurements from the environment. So some noise, some radiation levels, uh, vibration of components on, on a computer. And they are considered sources of randomness, true randomness. And they can be used to generate random numbers. The problem being is that we need something to measure those sources. And they don't generate many random numbers over a short period of time. That is, they don't generate many bits per second. We often need for some applications to have many thousands of bits of randomness to support our application. So what we do is we have algorithms that take uh, some initial value, some seed value, and generate a sequence of bits, which we hope to be close to a true random sequence. So we call a pseudo-random sequence, and the algorithm a pseudo-random sequence number, gener number generator, PRNG. There are different algorithms, some better than others. We, to introduce a simple one, we went through LCG. And we saw, just with a simple equation, a multiplier times the previous value plus an increment mod by m, we can generate, we generate a short sequence in our case. But it's an OK generator for generating a random sequence of numbers, a sequence of random numbers, as long as we choose the parameters correctly. Okay, so people have done analysis of this generator and found that for certain values of A and a l large modulus, which is prime, it turns out that it does generate a good sequence. But there are others, and that was one we chose just because it's easy to calculate. Uh, another one, Blum Blum Shub Generator, developed by Mr. and Mrs. Blum and Mr. Shub. And Slightly different, but the algorithm is not very complex. You start with two large prime numbers, P and Q. There are some conditions on what primes you can choose. You multiply them together to get some value n. Then you choose some random number s, and that random number s must be relatively prime to n. What does relatively prime mean? We will see in the next topic on number theory, but it means the numbers, the greatest common divisor of s and n should be 1. Okay. We'll define that in the next topic. But we choose some large, we generate some large n. If we have two large primes, multiply them together, we get a large n, and then another random number, smaller than an n. And then we follow this algorithm. Our initial output, so our outputs will be x. Our initial output s squared mod n. So we're using mod similar to the LCG algorithm. s squared mod n. And then you continue forever to do these two steps. You take the previous value, xi minus 1, the previous value that we got, x0, square mod n, and you get the next value. And you keep doing that. And you just get a, so you start with some random number s, Square it, mod by n, and you get the next value. Square that, mod by n, the next value, and just keep doing that. So quite easy to calculate. The last step, b, is that instead of using the number x that comes out, they take the last bit of that number. If you mod a number by 2, you get that last bit, 0 or 1. And this is quite a simple algorithm. We'll not go through an example. There's one on the next slide. It's quite a simple algorithm that generates quite a good sequence of pseudo-random numbers. I don't expect you 
remember uh, that that algorithm, we will not go through an example uh, in, in class, this one lists the values for different iterations, that is some initial values, p times q, two primes, they are not large primes, 383 is a very small prime, we'll see in the next topic we'll talk about large primes, but for this example, two primes multiplied together and choose some random s and you take s squared mod by n and you get 20,749 you take that squared mod by n and you get the next number squared mod by n and you get these numbers the sequence that comes out is the last bit of those numbers if it's odd it will be 1 if it's even it will be 0 if you think of the last bit of that number in binary, a 0 or 1. So the sequence that comes out is 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0. It doesn't look very random there, but that's just a coincidence here. 0, 1, 0, 0, and, and keeps going. Okay. So this is an example of a different pseudo-random number generator. And is considered, so people have analyzed the design and see if it uh, generates sequences which... Uh, exhibit characteristics of true random number generators and they say yes it does it's a good one and quite simple there are others yes so the, are the, the, the B's in this case the random so the sequence we get is the values of the bits that come out all right so yes the random numbers are um, these are random numbers coming out, but as a sequence, we take just the last bit of each. If you have just the last bit, as opposed to the actual number, the number may give away some information about where we are in the sequence. Okay? But the last bit, if I see the last bit is zero, well, there's only two choices. We don't know whether if I know this sequence 1100111 as the attacker, can I work out those initial values? If I could work out the initial values, then I can know what the next value will be. But if the attacker just knows the past values of the bits, how do you work out what the next one will be? Well, you need to know the initial values. Uh, so most of our pseudo-random number generators go forever. They generate a continuous sequence. So we can keep going. Let's say this algorithm is implemented in, in software on our computer. When we call the random function that starts this algorithm, it produces, say, 8 bits. We call it again, it produces the next 8 bits in the sequence. As we call that algorithm, it grabs the next sequence of bits as, for as long as we need. That was the same with the LCG. It generates a sequence, except it does come back to the start. Remember, there's a period of that sequence. So the, the strength of this algorithm is that if the attacker just knows those bits, for example, if they see that those 20 bits listed, the attacker wants to know the 21st bit. What will it be? 0 or 1? Well, they have a 50% chance to guess, but can they know for sure what it will be next? And what will the next 10 bits be? If they can, this algorithm is insecure. If they can predict the next value, then they'll know what value you choose as the next value. So the security of this scheme comes if you know those past 20 bits, it should be practically impossible for the attacker to work out the next bits. And it's considered to be the case in this algorithm. But to get those next bits, you actually need to know the previous value, 48,060, but the attacker only knows the bits. He doesn't know these numbers listed here, the x values. The person generating those bits knows that number. They just square the number mod by n, which they also know.
the security actually depends upon how those initial values are chosen, the prime numbers, but we will not get to that until the next topic. We'll talk about prime numbers and the role they play in other cryptographic algorithms. There are others. There are other algorithms for generating pseudo-random uh, sequences. And a different approach is not to have your own algorithm that's just for generating random numbers, but to use something that we already know about, which is uh, encryption. When we encrypt something, our goal is to generate random ciphertext. Okay, so the idea of encryption, we take our structured plain text, encrypt it, such that the output ciphertext, ciphertext appears random. And that's a good encryption algorithm if that happens. So because our ciphers that we've designed for encryption produce random outputs, use them as random number generators. And that's another approach. There are different ways to take existing ciphers and use them as random number generators. Here's two approaches. The first, so it doesn't matter what block cipher we have, whether it's AES, DES, or something else. It's a block cipher. It takes B bits in of plain text, produces B bits out of cipher text, and it has a key coming in. So one way we can generate a sequence of bits, the encrypt rectangle here means apply our block cipher, like AES. It takes a secret key as input. K is the key that the user chooses. And another initial value will denote the value, the vector or value V here as input because our block cipher, remember, takes a key in a plain text. All right, we're not encrypting plain text here. We're just encrypting this initial value V. If encrypt was DES, the key would be effectively 56 bits and V would be 64 bits because it's a 64-bit block cipher. This is the counter mode of operation, similar to what you've seen in the, the, the last quiz, where we take some initial value that the user chooses. Say, I choose V and I choose K. I encrypt the initial value of V. I get some ciphertext that comes out, and that ciphertext should be random. The idea of encryption, plain text goes in, random bits come out. So we get the first sequence of random bits. Then we use the same key, encrypt again, but encrypt our value plus one. We increment. This is the counter mode. So if the first value was uh, 10,000 in decimal, I encrypt that, I get some ciphertext. Uh, then I encrypt 10,001, get some ciphertext. 10,002, get some ciphertext, and those set of ciphertext values is my sequence of bits. We talk about a seed is the initial value of a random number generator. In this case, the seed is made up of two values, the key and the initial value V. So I must choose those to get started. And then the algorithm just keeps going forever, generating bits which are uh, considered uh, pseudo-random. So this is good because we just reuse our existing ciphers. We know that our existing ciphers have been analyzed a lot and considered secure. We know that they do produce random outputs, so they're very easy to use. We have software and hardware implementations already, so it's uh, practical to use existing ciphers. The picture on the right is just a different way to do that. It's called the output feedback mode. We encrypt our initial value using the key. We take the ciphertext and encrypt that with the same key. Take the ciphertext, which is our output bits, but then encrypt that. Our ciphertext that comes out at the start is random, and then it becomes the input. And if you encrypt a random input, Again, you get different output all the time. Again, the, the seed is the combination of the key and that initial value V.
why use, why not use one of these versus, say, BBS, blum blum shub? What's the difference? Assuming they both produce equivalent pseudo-random sequence of bits, what could be a difference between them? Why would I choose one, not the other? What do we care about? Assuming they're both secure, what's our limitation? We care about performance, all right? So in, in security, there are a key trade-off. Security versus performance, or, or more generally, convenience. All right? But often that comes down to, in terms of implementations, performance. How fast it does something is a key thing. These algorithms of blum blum shub are quite simple. There's a square, a mod, and grab some bits. In hardware, quite easy to implement. Whereas, if you recall back to, to simplified DES, the real DES, there are many different operations that go, we go through multiple rounds, so that can be slower in hardware. So using existing block ciphers is okay from a security perspective, but sometimes can take time to generate compared to the other approaches. But time, here we're talking about microseconds, maybe milliseconds difference. There's, there's not a significant difference. It depends upon your application. So we're just going through the different approaches for pseudo-random number generators. Use block ciphers is one way. Have dedicated algorithms like the previous ones is another approach. This is another one that uses block ciphers. It was a standard. ANSI, A-N-S-I, created, uh, creates a number of standards in the US and used outside. And this was a standard used for uh, generating random numbers. And it actually used triple deaths. So it used a block cipher. Just a different example. It used triple deaths three times. All right, so we'll see a block in the next slide, and it has three encrypt blocks. There's triple deaths uh, in each of them. It takes different inputs. It takes the current date and time, right, some timestamp. So when we do this operation, what's the current date and time? Some seed value, which we've chosen by the user and some keys. In this case, we use two keys, K1 and K2, so also chosen by the user. It produces, in one iteration, 64 bits of pseudo-random bits as output, and it generates the next value of the seed, which will be used in the next iteration. So we keep going using the, the, that output. So this one is designed specifically for triple deaths. Where's triple deaths in this picture? The EDE is triple deaths. The one way that triple deaths was designed was to do an encrypt with deaths, a decrypt with deaths, and an encrypt with deaths. Three deaths operations, triple deaths. And they use two keys as input, K1 and K2. So K1 and K2 are fed into each of those three EDE blocks. The inputs are the date and timestamp, current date and time, and some initial value V. There are some operations to, to combine the output of the first encrypt with an XOR, use it into second encrypt, and then we do a third encrypt. We get a, the next value of our seed as output, V, and we also get some random bits out. To get more random bits, we take the next value of V and do it all again. We'll have a new timestamp. It'll be some time later. We'll have a new value of V, the same key. We keep using the same key. And we'll encrypt those three times, get another sequence of random bits, and keep going. So this is just a, a third example of using our existing block ciphers to generate random numbers. This one was widely used, and still is used, because it became a standard uh, in, in government use. A 
again, the point isn't to remember these algorithms, but just to see some examples. We're seeing we're using our normal encrypt block ciphers. What other operation? This is XOR, exclusive OR. And as computer engineers, you know exclus exclusive ORs are very easy to implement in hardware. Okay? Hardware can do an XOR very easily. It's a very basic operation. So therefore, it's very fast if we use XORs. And exclusive ORs we've seen in many of our uh, algorithms. We've seen it in DES. There's an XOR in different stages. We see it here. Stream ciphers in the next few slides and others. XOR is common, a common operation. It's a good thing to mix things together. If you want to take two values, especially when one of them's random, you exclusive OR them and the output will be random. Okay, so that's a very useful operation and used uh, in a number of cases. It's fast and, and very easy and produce a secure output if used correctly. So that's it on pseudo-random number generators. We have dedicated algorithms. We just saw two examples, LCG and BBS. And we could also use existing block ciphers to, to generate pseudo-random numbers. Any questions? Yes. Each, each EDE, there are three EDE blocks, is triple DES. Right. So there are three instances of triple DES here, or nine instances of DES. Now, triple DES is just single DES three times. The E means encrypt with DES. The D means decrypt with DES. So that was the way that triple DES was designed. Encrypt, decrypt, encrypt with single DES, but using different keys, K1 and K2. If DES is slow, then this is nine times slower than DES. Okay, we need to do DES nine times to do this. So performance may be an issue. And performance in practice is mainly an issue, the speed is mainly an issue if we, we need to generate random numbers quickly. Like we are um, sending data in real time across the internet. We generate the data from some source, someone speaking or there's some video and we want to encrypt it. We need a random number. So we need to generate that random number quickly so that we can encrypt and send with small delay. So with real-time data transfer, that's when performance is, is something to be considered. And that's when maybe a dedicated random number generator is better than the block cipher ones. These are a bit slower. But for your computer, for generating random numbers for keys and so on, any of them are OK. What does your computer use? If we go back to the principles, we said somewhere that our pseudo-random number generator takes some initial value, a seed. But we don't want the attacker to know what the seed value is, because that is an initial parameter for our uh, generator. So it makes sense to generate that seed randomly. So a common approach is to have a true random number generator, generate the seed, and then use that to generate the pseudo-random uh, bit stream. So the seed may be one, say, 64-bit or 128-bit value, which is used for a, sh a day, for example, whereas the bit stream that comes out for that day may be millions or billions of bits. So the idea is we apply the true random number generator to generate a small sequence of bits and use that small sequence to generate a large sequence of bits. 
So that's a practical application. Where does my laptop get the true random number generator? Well, there are ways that computers will, will generate uh, true random number generate true random numbers. It depends on your operating system. For example, what mine does, it just in this picture, it has different sources of true randomness. When I hit keys on the keyboard, the time when I hit them, not the second or the hour, the second or hour when I hit the keys may be quite predictable. When I type a word, there may be a one, one second between each key. But the millisecond or the microsecond when I hit that key is quite unpredictable and consider it a source of randomness. Let's see if we show an example. When I hit a key, note the timestamp will be given here. It's hard to see, it scrolls very quickly, but here's a timestamp where the last three numbers are the milliseconds. So if we zoom in, the last three numbers are the milliseconds. Just wait, I'll hit a key, the space bar. So the last three numbers were 839 on the bottom most one, 174 at the bottom of the screen near my mouse, 5796174, hit it again, 571. Even if I type A, B, C, D, E, F, every about half a second I was hitting a key, so that that's predictable, but the last three numbers, 888, 839, 345, and so on, and especially, so they're in milliseconds, if we went down to the microsecond level, those numbers are effectively random. Right? So it's hard for someone to predict what they will be. So what my computer does is takes those values, every time I hit a key, records those values, and uses them as a source of true randomness. Not just when I hit keys, when I move the mouse. As I move the mouse, those numbers are changing. And again, when I move the mouse and do different things, when I click, those numbers, the millisecond and microsecond, are considered random. The other thing that your computer does is disk operations. So when you read files, write files, you do different uh, operations on the disk. Again, the millisecond, microsecond timestamps are uh, effectively random and maybe hardware interrupts when, when different devices do things, when my Wi-Fi wakes up, when the screen does something, and so on. Those are all combined together and mixed together. How do we mix those values? What's a good way to mix things? If I have two times, like the timestamp in microseconds of my keyboard was 839 and my mouse was 746, to mix them together, we could exclusive order values. Two random values, exclusive order together, generate another random value. So that's one way to mix them all together. And that, those values, from my operating system's perspective, are called the, the primary entropy pool, which is really a sequence of random bits, which are then used in the pseudo-random number generators. So then algorithms use those as seeds to generate more bits. And other operating systems do similar things. They use, record the user activity and use that as a true random number source. To see those values, my computer treats the, the random numbers as like a, a file. When I read the file, I can see those random bits. It's a device on my computer, the random device. When I look at it, it doesn't look very nice because it's all random, but if we convert the bits to binary, it's just random characters, there are the random bits that come out. Okay? 
And what's happening, we may see over time, we may get some more coming up. Let's stop that. So these are the last set of random bits that came out at this line 7E. And my computer, depending on what I do on my computer, I move my mouse around and press some keys elsewhere, and a few more bits come out. Because what's happening is my operating system's measuring what I do on the computer, mixing all of that together, and producing a random sequence of bits coming out. Here it's quite slow. That is, each line is 6 by 8 is 48 bits. Each line down the bottom is 48 bits. And then not many bits being generated. Okay, so every few seconds, another 48 bits are generated. So the way that your computer generates those bits, uh, it's important to be aware of that because when you use this to generate a key, you need to make sure that the key length that you can generate at that point in time is large enough. Okay, here it's quite slow. Let's finish on pseudo-random number generators. So that was an example from my operating system's perspective. Uh, the details of how they work is quite important, but we don't have time for all of that. The last topic here, stream ciphers. At the very, one of our first lectures, we distinguished between block ciphers and stream ciphers. Block ciphers encrypt, say, 64 bits, might maybe 128 bits at a time. Stream ciphers encrypt one bit or one byte at a time. And the general difference is that stream ciphers aim to be faster than block ciphers. And stream ciphers are quite simple in that they generate a random sequence of bits and exclusive or the plain text with that sequence of bits. So we see XOR come up again. There are different stream ciphers available, but their general design is shown on this slide. We have some plain text, and we talk about a stream of plain text. That is, when I'm talking, if I have a mobile phone that I'm talking into, that mobile phone converts my voice, the analog audio, into bits. And as I continue talking, a stream of bits are generated to be sent across the mobile phone network. If I want to encrypt my voice, so in real time encrypt what I'm saying so that someone cannot intercept, then we think my voice is the input stream of plain text, continuous stream of bits as I talk. And what the stream cipher does, we have a key. So the user chooses a secret key. And that key is used to generate a sequence of bits which is considered pseudo-random. So we use a pseudo-random number generator, or a byte generator. It maybe generates numbers, but we usually generate a byte at a time, like the ones we've seen already. And that generates some random bits, or a random byte. So be careful here. The uppercase K is the secret key that the user chooses. The lowest case K is called the key stream, which, or the, the random bit stream. That's the random bits that come out. And to encrypt, I XOR my plain text with that random sequence of bits. So say as I talk, I'm generating bits, and every byte or every eight bits of plain text uh, XORed with every 8 bits of the key stream, K. And the next 8 bits of plain text are simply XORed with the next random K. Where the pseudo random byte generator just generates 8 bits of randomness with the same key, and we keep going XOR, and the output is the ciphertext. We send the ciphertext across our network. The receiver, who must have the same key, 
takes and uses the same pseudo-random number generator. So with the same input and the same algorithm, you'll get the same output. So the same values of k. And you XOR k with the ciphertext C, and the properties of exclusive OR is that you'll get the plain text back. If you XOR the plain text with k and get C, if you XOR C with the same k, you get P. Everyone remembers that from their basics of computer hardware, properties of XOR. A reminder. Effectively, what we're doing is the ciphertext is obtained by taking the plain text and XOR with lowercase k, the key. Let's say these are 8-bit values. So if we use that same k and we do C X or K, what is C? Well, it's P X or K. That is the encryption, is this step. Take our plain text, XOR with a key, uh, sorry, with the key stream, we get ciphertext. If we take that same ciphertext and XOR with the same key stream, lowercase k, then that's equivalent to P, XOR k, XOR k again. What's k, XOR k? They cross, they cancel each other out. K is 0, K X or K. If K is 0, 0, X or 0, 0. 1, X or 1, 0. Okay, so we get 0 here, they cancel each other out effectively, and it becomes C, X or K. These two disappear, we're left with P. The plain text X or 0 is simply the plain text. So exclusive or encryption and decryption, we can use the same operation, exclusive or. This is the decrypt. Plain text, XOR the key stream, we get the cipher text. To decrypt, just XOR that cipher text with the same key stream, it needs to be the same value, and you'll get the original plain text. And the good thing about XOR, it's very fast. Okay, so as long as we can generate random bytes quickly, encryption is very fast here. As I generate my plain text, I can quickly XOR it with some random bits and get the ciphertext and send that. And that's where the power or the, the benefit of stream ciphers come in, the speed. And a, the idea, of course, is that K is random or pseudo-random. Note when I say random from now on, often I mean pseudo-random. I will not distinguish. So this should be random. And if you exclusive or some random set of bits with some structured set of bits, some plain text, the output should also appear random. Because what XOR does is just change those bits depending upon whether it's a matching 0, 0, we get a 0, 1, 1, we get a 0, or if they're not matching, then we get a 1 as output. If one of those inputs, k, is random, then it's going to change the output bits randomly. So the ciphertext will be random as it comes out. Even 
if the plain text is structured, we'll get random ciphertext. An example of that if we have plain text, structured plain text, 8 bits, structured, I just chose 4 bits of 0, 4 bits of 1, and we XOR with some random key, and I'll try and choose randomly. So this should be my random key, this is my structured plain text. When we XOR, what do we get? Well, our structured plain text, here we're going to get 1. This bit will change if it's different from the key stream bit and it will stay the same if it's the same and because the key stream bits are random then the bits that will change in our plain text will be random here we, we got a different one so we end up with a change value change So the property of XOR is that with one value that's random as this one's structured, not random, but with one value as random input, the output would be random. And that's what we want from encryption, produce random ciphertext. If you take it a couple of steps further, you'll see if you use this correctly, XOR is equivalent to the one-time pad. The one-time pad is the only unconditionally secure algorithm that we know of. There's only one algorithm we know which is perfect, offers perfect security, the one-time pad. In fact, the exclusive OR provides that capability. It is a one-time pad. However, the key must be used correctly. That's a good exam question. Prove XOR is a one-time pad. So stream ciphers, in general, quite simple. We just need a random number generator. Well, we've seen some in the previous slide, some examples of random number generators, the LCG, BBS, or we could actually use uh, block ciphers, but that doesn't make sense if we want to improve performance. And there are other algorithms we can use there. A widely used, well, no, some design issues first. So this is in general with stream ciphers and also random number generators. When we have a random number generator, we said with LCG it produces a sequence and then it repeats. So the length of that sequence before it repeats is called the period. So we want it to have a very large period so it doesn't repeat very often. So that's a, a, a design criteria when considering the algorithm and parameters. The key stream or the output should be, appear to be truly random. Right? It should exhibit randomness. And the key that we use as input must be large enough. If someone can guess the initial key, uppercase K, then they can generate the key stream. So that's uh, something to consider. When we compare to block ciphers, stream ciphers are usually easier to implement and as a consequence much faster to operate. But if we reuse the key with a stream cipher, then it makes it easy for the attacker to break it. Whereas with block ciphers, by re we can reuse the key for as long as we like in theory as long as the attacker can't guess it. But if we reuse the key with stream ciphers and end up encrypting this, the same plain text multiple times with the same key, and if the attacker discovers some known plain text ciphertext pairs, it's quite easy for them to work out what the key is. Okay. So a common way that stream ciphers work is that if we have a key, then it's changed on a regular basis. 
or another value, say you, you combine a secret key with some initial value, some timestamp such that changes on a regular basis. The last one is just an example of a, a common stream cipher. It's been around for a long time. It uh, is now considered to have some weaknesses and no longer recommended. RC4. <coughs> RC4 developed by Ron Revest. And remember the last name because it will come up again. He developed RC4 and also some other ciphers we'll see. And it's been used widely in web browsing, so when you connect to a website when it says HTTPS, in the past that commonly used RC4 to encrypt the data sent between your web browser and server. So when you're downloading the web page from the web server to your browser, the server uses RC, or in the past at least, used to use RC4 to encrypt that web page. It would XOR with some random bit stream and send the, the cipher text. You would decrypt. And in Wi-Fi, if you used, what was it, WEP. In Wi-Fi today, if you choose the secure mode, the encryption, there's usually different options like WPA, WPA2. And the older one was WEP, WEP. And that one used RC4. But it had some weaknesses in, in Wi-Fi encryption that meant it was no longer used. <clears throat> it was very simple and efficient, so it was widely used because of that. It allowed for different key sizes. There are some theoretical limitations, and, and if you use the keys in the wrong manner, it's easy to break. And nowadays, people recommend against it for web browsing and Wi-Fi. So web browsers over the last one or two years are, are stop using RC4 and mainly use AES and a few other ciphers. AES is fast enough to, to almost match the speed of stream ciphers. So that's one uh, widely used stream cipher. There are some slides that go through the algorithm which we will not do in this course this semester. So if you want to see one real stream cipher you can look through. It's not so hard to go through. Um, it's in about 10 or 15 lines of code to implement this. And the lines of code simply are uh, some loops, there's a mod operation, some additions and another mod, a swap, changing uh, parts of memory, some more mods and additions so that the operations are very basic from a computer's perspective and therefore very fast to implement. And finally an XOR. XOR the plain text with the key stream. So that brings us to the end of random numbers. We'll see that they're used throughout some other topics as well. We'll assume from now on that we can generate secure random numbers, good random numbers. But in practice, some of the, uh, the flaws in algorithms have been due to poor random number generators. Some of the, the, the hacks that, say, the NSA and others did, which were released by Snowden and others, were due to uh, compromised random number generators. One of them was that a random number generator, which was widely used and standardized, was uh, supposedly the NSA created a backdoor into that so that they could detect and predict what the random values will be coming output whereas you didn't think they would do that and therefore they could work out your key. Random number generator design is complex but very important. Questions to finish this topic? Any random questions? Now's a good time. We'll have a break soon.
We don't go through the algorithms in much depth. LCG was a quick example, uh, just the concepts.